We're in uh, Psalm 86 tonight, and it'll be a, uh, I'm sure, a, a welcome, a welcome change. It is uh, another Psalm of David. We haven't heard from David in a long while. We've heard a lot from the uh, sons of Korah and um, the Psalms of Asaph, and this this Psalm um, carries on carries on a theme. Um, of trusting in the Lord when we're in trouble. And I think each of us can say um, we've either, we're either in trouble or we know somebody is in trouble. Um, sometimes we're, um, we may not be in a hard time right now, but we might be coming out of one. Uh, we may be moving into one. We, we, don't, we don't always know. But this is, this is titled a prayer rather than a song. And a lot of what David did was like journaling. Um, he wrote down his thoughts. He was a poet. He was a songwriter, a musician, and uh, an artist, uh, uh, while at the same time being a warrior and a king and a leader. And uh, blessed. He was absolutely blessed by God. And, um, and part of the reason he was blessed was because he was a man after God's own heart. He had... He never lost his humility, even even in um, even in his worst times. He always knew that he needed to trust God, and that's clear through his psalms. There were times when he was puffed up. There were times when he absolutely failed, um, but he always turned back to God, uh, and that's that's what the the heart of this psalm is is tonight. So I'm going to read from the New International Version tonight. Psalm 86, hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. Arrogant foes are attacking me, O God. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. They have no regard for you. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength in behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you, just as my mother did. <coughs> Give me a sign of your goodness, that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. The very first verse sums up the entire heart of this psalm. First, he, he asked God to hear him, but then he asked him to answer him. And he's not saying, um, tell me what I want to hear. And he's, not, he's not saying, um, you're never there for me the way that I wanted you to be. And he's not really trying to remind God, I need you to answer me. But what he's doing is, He's calling attention to his situation. And it's, 
it's easy for us to not want to pray because God knows what we're going through. If we believe in his sovereignty, in his omnipotence, in his omniscience, and he's all-knowing and all-powerful and um, alpha and omega, beginning and end, he never had a beginning. He's always been and always will be. He already knows what I'm going through, so what good does it do when I, when I pray to him? And then when I do pray, why, why am I always so selfishly praying? I might start out praying for the orphans and the, the sick and the afflicted, but where do we always end up in our prayers? And Lord, remember me and what I'm going through. And then sometimes you might even have a prayer um, where you say something like, I, I, know you, I know this isn't a big deal. And I feel really bad about praying this and asking, but um, you know, whatever, I've been down in my back. Will you, will you please make that pain go away? Or, um, I've been really anxious lately and I sure could use a little peace and comfort. But it, it might feel selfish to pray prayers like that or to even, even open up in prayer because God already knows what you're going through. What good does it do? He already knows and if he wants to fix it, he will. But the truth is, like David says here, God wants to hear from us. He, nothing that we have is too big or too small for him. Um, like you, you, you've seen this before where you'll have a small job that you need to call a contractor for, you know, uh, and you, you can't get anybody to come do the job or do the work because it's just too small. It doesn't pay them to come and do that job. Or vice versa, you may have a job that's just too big and they see the job and they, or they hear the, what they think the job is gonna be and they say, mm, I don't wanna do that. And I do that in my work. I'll get, I'll get a request to do an appraisal and I'll see what they want me to do and I'll say, I don't really wanna do that one. So I'll tell them a high price and a long time period. I can do it in a month and a thousand dollars. They're not gonna hire me to do that. And I'm, whew, thank goodness, because I didn't wanna do it anyway. You know, the money would have been good, um, but it was an assignment that I didn't want to take because for whatever reason, God's not like that. When we do that, and we're all guilty of it, I'm sure, when we overlay uh, our human characteristics and thought process on the way God is, we take away from who he is. It's not in his character. There's no prayer too small. There's no problem too big. So... And I was trying to tell a friend this earlier this week that doesn't like praying for himself. There's a difference between being selfishly praying and asking, treating God like he's a genie in a bottle and actually taking your concerns to him, actually saying, hey, I'm hurting here and, and I, I can't fix this by myself. I need you. That's where the, the second part of this comes in, and it, it ties the two together. He says, hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. And that's, that's the question of tonight. Are you, are you and I, are we poor and needy? And not financially. There are a lot of people who are poor and needy financially. That's not what this is about. Even though any one of us, any one of us can be poor and needy financially at any time. We never know what's gonna happen. Um, you, you never know what the economy is going to do. Everybody's got good jobs right now, unemployment, all that stuff, but we never know what's going to happen. There was a time when um, Russians and Germans were burning their money to stay warm. You bet they never thought that would happen. There was a time when, in this country, when, when uh, brokers, bankers, realtors, investors were throwing themselves out of skyscrapers because they didn't want to deal with the stock market crash. There was a, a time in this country, uh, the, we, we went from, uh, just in our short history, what, what was called the Roaring Twenties, where everything was absolutely great, to the Thirties, entered into the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, and the only thing that really pulled us out of that was uh, economic uh, restructuring, FDR's uh, the New Deal, and then uh, entering into World War II. And the military's need for equipment and what we supplied to Britain and all those things, that's, that's kind of what pulled us out of it. There's nothing that says we can't go, something might happen again. That's not what David's talking about here. David's talking about poor in spirit. Uh, Jesus said it himself in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are those who submit to God. Blessed are those who are looking to God in everything first and, and obeying and being uh, trusting in him. David, I was saying earlier, David is David's not perfect. He's, he's far from perfect as a, as a man. He went from, what, what, what do we say? What's David's story in a nutshell? Shepherd boy who defeated Goliath, but nobody thought that he could or should. And how he, how he even got out on the battlefield is, is really, really. I mean, we, we read the story, but then you got to think, why in the world did King Saul ever let him go out there? That don't make any sense. Because if, what did Goliath say? If I beat him, you're all my slaves. And King Saul, God had to speak to him. It had to be the Holy Spirit to say, no, I'm with this one. And he sent David out, and David beat Goliath, and then he became famous, and he became um, a heart player for, for King Saul. And as he grew up, he became a warrior, and he went out and won many, many battles until he became more famous than Saul, and Saul got jealous, right? And then Saul started, sought to kill him, and he had to flee, and eventually Saul did die, and then David became the king, and then uh, Israel was, or, you know, uh, was blessed because of it and they they prospered but then what happened david got puffed up he was praised up to the point that he forgot you know for a moment he had a moment of weakness or a, a time period of weakness and he committed his sin the sin that all of us know that he uh, slept with another man's wife and then after he got her pregnant he tried to hide it by having that man killed he did have that man killed. So he's guilty not only of adultery, but murder. And he tried to hide all that until it was made public by the prophet Nathan. And what did David do? Did he have Nathan killed? He didn't. He didn't say, nope, I gotta keep this conspiracy going. You know, gotta take him out and everybody that might know. He humbled himself. And so seeing David being blessed in his life after such a public sin, makes a lot of people step back and say, wait a minute, are you telling me God blesses sinful people? And the answer to that is yes. As bad as we don't like to admit it, are you a sinful person? I am. And I pray that he blesses me. For, him, for me to pray for him to bless me is no different than watching him bless David. The difference, the difference is if I didn't have a pure submissive heart the way that David did. David, when he realized his sin had been brought to the open, submitted, or admitted, then submitted. The difference between David's sin and most of ours is his was public. A lot of our sins are never made public. I, 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 there's some stuff I'm never going to tell you guys. I mean, it's not going to happen if I can help it. Um, but someday, won't all of those be brought to the light? But by that time, I'm not worried about it because my, those sins are covered. So by the time you do know what I'm ashamed of, Jesus is going to say, come with me, my good and faithful servant. That's what I'm praying that I hear. And that, what, what better blessing than that? That is the ultimate blessing, that he is going to forgive my sins, has forgiven my sins, and will continue to bless those who are um, what do you want to do? Uh, it's Psalm 57. It's what David prayed uh, right after, right after his sin was brought out to the open. This was his, this was his prayer. Psalm 57, no, Psalm 51, 17. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Contrite means submissive humble, modest, lowly, that he, he brought himself down from his throne, his high seat. He could have been just like Saul, and he could have lashed out, you know, but that's not what he did. So what do we, what do we learn from a psalm like Psalm 86? No matter what our trouble is, take it to God. He wants to hear it in prayer. When we pray, pray with a humble and contrite heart. Be poor and needy. <coughs> When we seek Him to fix all things, let's, 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 
there's a, there's a, it's been popular for a very long time. It's not new. You hear people saying all the time, follow your heart. Just follow your heart. Um, it's a popular piece of advice in our culture, but Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Why does your heart want what it wants? There, when we say heart, we're not talking about the blood pump. We're talking about the part of us inside that, that God has put there. The same part that is um, easily confused, tricked, uh, deceived. The part that the devil wants to whisper at. Where does our sin, where does sinfulness come from? Scripture tells us sin, sinfulness comes from our own hearts. From our, it is from our own desires. And then it's the act. When we act on that desire, that's what breeds sin. And sin breeds death. It's from in here. So when a person, when a person says, I'm born that way, you know, um, it may not be too far off the mark. No, you were not born that way, but there's something inside of you. There's something inside of you that makes you want to go that way. And you're not... You, have, you, don't, you lack self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit, which is something we're supposed to strive for as Christians. There are things that I want to do that I am not to do as a Christian, and it takes self-control to not do those things. Um, how do we get from cultures and societies killing babies in, in religious ceremonies to that's not okay? Christianity is what did that. And Christianity is going to be the only way we get back to, no, it's not okay to kill babies because you don't want to have the baby and be responsible for it. You know, we've got to get back to that. And the only thing that's going to fix that is Christianity. Christianity is where truth comes from. It is the moral north compass. It just is. Without the Bible, without God, there is no truth. And without truth, there's no morality. Morality doesn't come from just what we think is right. Because what if what I think is right is for me and all, I don't know, for me and all my buddies to burn down your house. If it was right for us, that, it, it, I mean, obviously that's not right, but I'm, I'm, I'm using that as a, you know, an extreme. Um, I heard tell today that there are students at a school in Madisonville that are coming to school in dog collar because they identify as dogs. And they are requiring the school to provide them with litter boxes. And I'm, I'm glad they're doing that. I'm really glad they're doing that because it shows how stupid it is. Because it shows how stupid uh, and how, how far you can go with it. If we are, if we're gonna live in this uh, theoretical uh, thought experiment of reality. Reality isn't really what's true anymore. It's what you want it to be true. And they've done that. The, you know, the agenda pushing people, you know, whatever. They've done that so that they can get what they want. But when you open up Pandora's box, it's going gonna, it's gonna to flow over <coughs> everything else. So when somebody says, no, you can't pretend to be a dog, I can say, why can you pretend to be a man? Or why can you pretend to be a woman? It's no different. But no, that's just absurd. They're obviously not a dog. You're obviously not a woman. And we can have that conversation. I'm glad they're doing that. I hope it gets dumber. It's going to get dumber before it gets better. It's got to. And, and I'm okay with that. At least, at least it's making people talk. Well, that's just crazy. Yes, it is. You're absolutely right. It is. Because they're following their heart. What do they know? Uh, this was middle school, by the way. Sixth grade and under. <laughs> really? I know, um, I'll stop on a, on a soapbox, but what we have to do is always trust God. Paul said in Romans 7, 15, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do everything that I hate. And I can, I, there might not be, there might not be another set of scripture that I, 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 I relate to more than that. Because I know the truth and I love the truth but I still have a propensity for the thing that I despise and disgusts me and I just absolutely hate 
And yet, there it is, a thorn in our sides. And that's, that's the way this world is. It's full of that. And what we have to do is what David does. Submit and say, I am poor and needy. I need you. I can't do this on my own. I can't. I can't be the Christian you have made me to be on my own. I need you. Uh, I get all my strength from Jesus Christ. And the only way to get that, if I, if I get up in the morning and I go on my own strength until I fail and then I turn to him, what, what good is, what good? What good? You know? So it should be every day starting with that, starting with him. And, and I think we'd all be, us and every other church around here and across the, the nation, we'd be better off if they start with Jesus. It's that simple. This is a very simple song. He says, guard, in verse 2, guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. He doesn't say something like, I know I'll be saved uh, because of all that I do for you. I know that I've earned my, uh, oh, you know, I'm just the most humble person I know. <laughs> really? Because a humble person wouldn't say that. <laughs> You know, he really lowers himself and he puts himself out there. Can you imagine, really, can you really imagine if your sins, that one, maybe, I mean, David's got the one that we know of. There could be more. But David's got the one that's in the book. In the book, you know. Can you imagine if your one was in the book and they talked about it every time, every time his name is brought up? You remember that one thing that David did? God. All the good stuff I did, and y'all always talk about the one thing. Well, that's pretty bad, David. <laughs> it's pretty rough, man. Um, imagine if yours was out there. I don't want mine out there. But we don't have to have ours out there. David didn't have what we have. David knew of a coming Messiah. He didn't know what that meant, though. We do. We're, we're blessed. Above all people, we know more than any other generation we know more than, than the people that actually wrote the book. We know how it works out. And so what we should do and continue to do is pray to God to hear us, to answer us, to listen to him when he answers us, and then follow his direction, even if it doesn't seem like where we want to go. Because we trust in him. And we are a people who are poor and needy. We are those Christians that Jesus preached about. And we are blessed because of it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want to inherit the kingdom of heaven. I want to be there someday. So I want to remain poor in spirit and never be puffed up and never say, I've got this. Or, uh, well, I'm glad you picked me. We're going to do good stuff together. You know what I mean? That I need you. I need your grace today just as much as I did yesterday, if not more. I'm going to pick up my cross today, but it's heavy. And your help, you know, those kinds of things. If we, if we stay that way, I, I know God will bless us. He blessed David. He blessed the disciples. He blessed them all the way to their death. <laughs> I hope he blesses us to ours. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lives that you've given us and the blessings that you've already given to each and every one of us. We pray that we are a humble people, poor and needy, poor in spirit, and that you use each and every one of us to reflect your light into this world, and that you bless us, not because we deserve it, but because you've promised to do so. We pray that you hear us, and that you answer us, and that you give us clear guidance and direction on which way you want us to go. Let your word be uh, a light to our path, Help us be humble and modest. Give us true humility and help us submit to you and be obedient to you. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen.